Welcome to Day One of Goyle, the festival for all things in translation. Um, I'm really, really excited um, to start this on our opening day. Um, yeah, it's been a wild journey. It's been a wild journey. Um, so this started um, when I started painting these chalkboards um, for the Borderless Book Club, um, run by Parini Press. Um, they do a wonderful job and it just sort of escalated from there and before I knew it I was throwing a festival. <laughs> um, up this week we're going to be talking to authors such as Jinran, translators such as Robin Myers, um, we're going to be talking to publishing presses like Charco and um, Pioneer Press, the aforementioned. Um, and yeah, it should be really, really fun. I'm also hoping to, I'm also talking um, to some of my friends um, who are just very passionate about translated fiction and we had a nice chat about Calvino and Camus. Uh, so welcome. Thanks so much for coming here on the first day. I hope you stick around for the rest of the week. Uh, to start with this evening, um, you are now very privileged to the world premiere of a five minute time lapse of me building this dome. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Oh, an orc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. And he lifts it. <laughs> yes. Oh, Jacob, you're a hero. <laughs> Sorry
Hi. <laughs> um, I'd like to think I am channeling my best Michael Morfogo to you all today. Um, to my knowledge, I have never seen him not in an orange jumpsuit, boiler suit. He sort of wears like the jacket and trousers. Hi. Dreams. <laughs> um, I would like to introduce some really important people to helping make this festival happen. Um, first up, we have the wonderful official bookshop of Greel. And that is Green Ink Booksellers based in Hay on Wye. Um, Josh and Ellen are wonderful people and good friends of mine. And I hope that um, you will go there if you need a book. Um, they're taking orders via email and uh, they are always very prompt. Um, so, uh, also, um, we have our artist in residence, Eleanor Cowell, who I am very pleased to be joining us to, um, for this week, and um, I can't wait to see what she has in store for us. Um, and then, last but not least, um, Will Dawson is the creative associate of the festival. Um, his main role is to sort of push me when I get a bit scared, and um, he does a very good job with it. Um, first up, to start us in um, and ease us into this week, is the wonderful um, journalist and junior editor of Polyester Zine, Jemima Scala. For those of you um, who don't know, this is Jemima Scala, um, the wonderful um, journalist and junior editor um, for Polyester Zine. Um, if you don't know, would highly recommend Polyester Zine. Um, it's only £3.50 and um, it's well worth the money. Um, uh, Jemima has written for The Guardian, Resident Advisor, a bunch of people, um, and she's also a gem of human. Who um, <laughs> So um, uh, she has chosen a um, what could could be described as um, basic bitch, controversial, and also like the best thing ever um, to talk about. Oh, um, for those of you who have never encountered Murakami, um, which I would imagine is not very many, um, he has a lot of books. He has a lot of books. Uh, these are all my brothers. I have actually never read any Murakami. Um, slightly intentionally, because um, I obviously was aware of him, um, but always felt like he was never on the top of my reading list. Um, and I did try IQ84 once and stopped. So what made you pick Murakami? Well, I think when I was, so I was a very precocious 12 year old and read way above my level of comprehension just because it was something to read. So I was like always looking for like what looks cool on my parents' bookshelves. So I think I picked up um, the Wind Up Bird Chronicle when I was like preteen, started reading it and I was just like, this is so bizarre. I d it like did not even compute with any level of understanding that I had. So that was my first encounter. And then we actually read Norwegian Wood uh, in like September. Um, we started like a little book group amongst our friends because we missed uni <laughs> talking about books. So we like Norwegian Wood was the first book that we read and the first proper sit down Murakami experience I've had. Um, and then after that, I read a couple more of his um, and I have some thoughts yeah. on him as a writer. But I love Norwegian Wood. It's like amazing. It really grabbed me. And um, he tends to be there are people who I know who don't read any books and love any other books and love Murakami. Like he, he does have a reach and a grasp and people love Murakami. Oh, yeah. I understand it with um, Norwegian Wood cause it like, it was the one that made him a bit of a superstar in Japan um, in like the late eighties when it came out or something. And I totally get that. Like it is such, um an imagination spinner like it's so tender and sweet and like so full of love and longing that of course it's sort of like very um sort of easy popular lit um fodder i suppose but with an edge of something slightly more and then the other books of his i've read i did go back to the wind up Bow chronicle and i read hard-boiled wonderland as well they are so like bro lit yeah you know what i mean like really like that is the impression i've got <laughs> and it's just like a bit bizarre and a bit surreal and like 
philosophical in the way that I imagine it is like beam me up soft boy kind of way like I feel like I've had those conversations with a lot of men <laughs> I'm just like I don't need to read this anymore <laughs> it's just not my not my bag absolutely so did you and um, there's quite a lot in that so is that your opinion of his other works so like have you not enjoyed other works as much as you enjoyed Norwegian Wood yeah Norwegian Wood I've found is I mean of the other two that I've read I've really not read widely on him but like the other two Norwegian Wood is a bit of an exception like the the others um Hard Boy Wonderland and Wind Up Bird Chronicle are um like sort of more concerned with that surrealism and that um oh sorry that was me and that bizarre um like world building element I suppose but I just I really I'm a sentimentalist and I really like the like relationship aspect of Norwegian Wood <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't like a good romance life? exactly um, so what are um I guess how do you want to like sort of and talk about these things and talk about like the thoughts you have on Murakami where do you want to begin I so to bed it into Norwegian wood there is definitely um a real like I said a real tenderness towards the characters and his protagonists um but I think the protagonist is not the most interesting character which is really interesting and he always writes or I say always, when I say always, I mean from the other two that I've read. I'm, I'm not claiming to be a Murakami <laughs> expert. Um, but the, yeah, his, his writing or narrative perspective seems to be quite bedded in like quite closely with his own. And it's just, it's not an interesting one, I have to say. So like the, the other characters and the other um, settings are really what make Norwegian wood for me. Whereas I really, when he dives more into um, introspection in his other books, it just, it, it really doesn't interest me at all because I don't feel that like, like a malcontent is a very interesting narrative p perspective yeah. for me to read, like personally. Like I understand why that computes with other people, but. It's common, isn't it? I recently read a book um, that was so full of malcontent and it felt, I'm not sure. I, I, well, it was called Restless um, by Kenneth Mo, and it was it was just did nothing for me. Like I, it was just like I, yeah, get it. Like the character was sort of late teens, and I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, well, heard a lot of teenage boys feel like that. Like, so do. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't do anything for me. Like in a similar vein, early Ian McEwan leaves me so cold, and I hate him. <laughs> I just hate him and I think that's like what the rest of Murakami is like is it's just very introspective male yeah. persona which means that a lot of his female characters are so like 2D there's just like yeah. they're one thing and they're not terribly how well is, down. How is the female character in Norwegian word? The main female character is cast in this role of, um, I mean, she, uh, this might spoil it for people that haven't read it, but she ends up in a um, sort of like a sanatorium, but like a mental hospital, essentially. Um, wow, where have I come across that before? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but she's like, I didn't like the relationship between them is so well like so well fleshed out and it's so complex and beautiful but her like because it's it's written from the male perspective she is just like sad and that's like her one thing and then the other female characters like there's one of them who's just like she's quirky you know she's <laughs> the quirky one and then the other one is like Actually, to be fair, the, the, there's an older female character that he sort of becomes entwined with and she's incredibly um, complex and like very multifaceted. 
Um, so it does vary, but like generally young women don't come off well in Murakami. It's, it's, not, new. it's not new. It's not new. It's also interesting that um, that can be that, that, that without without being stereotypical and writing everyone off in one group. Um, it's interesting that that can coincide with a big international male readership. Like those two things have happened. Like if like that being a part of Murakami's writing and then a lot of a lot of people who I know who read Murakami uh, my brother <laughs> are male <laughs> um, you know like I do I do think there's definitely a gender element at play yeah yeah I, yeah. I think with um particularly in Hard Boiled Wonderland where it is so it's just, like nothing is explained you're really like he asked a lot of you as a reader which I don't mind um, but the, like, the philosophical aspect, I don't know, man, it does just feel a bit like some Tinder date, just being like, have you read Murakami? It's just like... Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, sorry, my favourite book is Jack Kerouac's On the Road. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually talk about that in my Oxford interview and I didn't get it. <laughs> Oh, we move, we move. <laughs> also had an Oxford interview, didn't get it. So <laughs> cute. Great minds. I swear to God. <laughs> yeah, like wouldn't have had like all the experience I had. Anyway, we digress. <laughs> um, how does Murakami's um surreal um compare with other elements? Because I think it's interesting that um there's there's a tradition of Japanese magical realism. Um, I've read some really good short stories recently, um, Picnic in a Storm, Where All the Wild Ladies Are, that were like amazing magical realism in Japan. Um, and then there are obviously a big um, tradition in Latin America of magical realism and books that seem to have been the most successful from different African countries have tended to also be um, particularly like your sort of segu, your multi-generational um, magical realism. Now, I've always been a bit like, well, I, I'm sure there's other things being written too, like, you know, like, let's go find it. Um, if yeah. anyone is interested in finding more um, African literature in particular, there's a woman called Kinna Reads, K-I-N-N-A Reads, and her blog is slightly inactive now, but she has so much back content of content. Um, she's based in Ghana and she has the best recommendations. Like, it's awesome. I, I'm, it's such a treasure trove. Like, I couldn't believe when I stumbled across it because I've been trying to find something that was like, <laughs> a list <laughs> um, for a while. Oh, yeah. and she ran this Africa reading challenge where she was doing all these it's fab anyway um so how do how do you think Murakami fits in with these different traditions of magical realism and all the si all similar elements of them yeah um well I, I can't say that I've read a lot of um Japanese magical realism and I mean, I've read, obviously, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, quarantine, um, and I you love the, of, huh? Have you read House of Spirits? Yes, I was just about to say, I've read, I've obviously read all my Isabella Allende, she's amazing, my girl. But she is. She's so good. But I, I like, I don't know, because this feels sort of tending more towards dystopia, like dystopic surrealism than a straight up magical realism, I think, because I think because it feels quite like turned in, whereas with like Hundred Years of Solitude, it's so much about like the wider spread of the family and like these tiny little branches that get picked up and then put down two chapters later like that feels more like global I suppose or uni universal to that one society. Also they tend to sort of like like a, I think a predominant feature of magical realism is referring to something impossible as if it's completely normal isn't it? Like mm -hmm. does Murakami do that and just sort of offhand? Okay. Totally. Yeah yeah so there's like there is very much uh, a lot of 
things that sort of you, you just take for granted because it's like, okay, I suppose like, oh, what was it? In Wind Up Bird, he just has to sit down a well for three days and someone like covers the well. So he like, he just might die and you're just like, cool. Like obviously that's not very like impossible, but it's just like, it's so beyond normalcy. I think it's, it is, it is very grounded in, in the normal. Like there's not any like, from from the ones that I've read, there's not any like spirits or like undead and stuff that's quite common in others. Um, Ooh. But, yeah, uh, it's it's good. Like it's definitely um, it's it's good to read. I don't know if I'd read any more Murakami, but I I think I'm glad I've read it just mm -hmm. to have thought about it, I suppose, and expanded a bit more on what I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh Absolutely. Um, are there any other books you'd like to mention in particular? Any other translated fiction gems? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> the other one that I was thinking about for this was um, Convenience Store Woman. I cannot remember who it's by. Um, it's by Murata. Um, oh, um, oh can, I, can, I, can I do this off the top of my head? Yeah, I'm going to look it up. Murata, um, I also love convenience store women. Um, Sayaka Murata. Yes, amazing. Such a good book. So bizarre. Again, one of those, I think quite in the Murakami tradition, like just very outsiders making these bizarre choices that you just take for granted and you're just like, oh, this is what their world is. You just like plonked in the middle of it. Um, loved convenience store women. Um, I have an interesting question I want to ask you about convenience store women. So um, I read it when it first came out mm -hmm. and I was working in a bookshop at the time and um, then a colleague of mine read it sort of maybe um, six months later and I saw she was reading it and I was like oh my god I loved it like less like what are you thinking about it and mm -hmm. um, she has autism and she was quite like worried about the portrayal of autism in it she um, didn't didn't think it was particularly <sighs> Well, obviously she should be the one voice in this opinion right now um but from what i remember of what she said um she was worried that it was too negative um too sort of othering and not um mm -hmm. not realistic mm -hmm. um i i remember defending it um and i remember having a really interesting conversation with her about it um and i definitely um felt that it was a really rather than being negative i didn't get a negative impression of it it was just like a different way of being and um, so i wonder what you think about that question yeah no i totally i definitely i see i i see why she would find it worrying because i think anyone reading because it's never specified like whether or not the main character is on the spectrum or not so you just you're reading it and i remember finishing it being like maybe like I don't know maybe she was autistic I'm not sure but because it's never spelled out um I think there it's is beautifully a... never spelled out like yeah. it's definitely not a question of like you need it spelled out it's she you know very much a part of it is that she just thinks in a different it, it, whatever um but spectrum we're all like spectrum there are lots of spectrums <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I do agree. I think because it was just so like uncompromising in its position, like you just were in her head. She was narrating, this is what she does. And I think because there's there's no other way for her, there's, that's just, you, you come to accept it as a reader. You're just like, this is just how it is. I think it. So do you, yeah. think, do you think that's magical realism? Because I I don't think that it is entirely, but like, is that a point where sort of Murakami pivots? On the one side, you have sort of convenience store women. On the other side, you have the more traditional magical realist tradition. I don't know. I don't think I would class convenience store women as magical realism at all. But I do think that element of, like I said, like outsiders, and like inhabiting the mind of someone who thinks completely differently to how you might normally. I think that's a really strong part of Murakami and particular, but I think for Murakami, it's more about situations. It's more situational. 
where he's just like placed into these completely bizarre happenings. When I say he, I mean the narrator, because it's invariably a man. But um, yeah, he's just, he just finds himself in these like outrageous scenarios and there's no explanation. There's no like real seeking an answer for why. He just sort of goes along with it, which I think is like definitely an element of communion store women as well can definitely be traced to that. You haven't by any chance um, read any of Ma Mario um, Vargas Llosa books, have you? No, I haven't. Um, I'd be very interested if anyone out there has. Um, there's a book called Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter, and um, in it, the sort of um, I only know about this because my sister told me about it. <laughs> so I'm I'm I haven't read it myself. Um, but in it, the um, I also read her essay on it. So I'm not like completely. <laughs> um, so um, in it, the um, author is basically the main character. He's also represented in all of the other characters and it's a really big exploration of identity that's sort of its central theme and it's it has this it, in it the main character is sleeping with his aunt and there's all this incest and then there's it's really like it's really oh. like patricide violence because it's also running along this radio novella storyline so clever that's so yeah it, it sounds, <laughs> it's awesome um but it's really dark and it also really descends into sort of what is real, what is not real, like is there any difference between fiction and real life? Because the whole point is that, um, I'll get to the question, I am going to, <laughs> the whole point is that, um, the whole point is that sort of the, to write well, um, the main character in the book has to draw on his own work and when he learns to do that he becomes a better writer mm -hmm. and, and because of the parallels between the protagonist in the book and the author's own life um you really it really raises that question of identity does Murakami do that I feel like you're kind of getting at maybe something similar yeah I would I would definitely say that um just the inwardness of a lot of his narration and plots um would strongly suggest that I mean he draws on his own thoughts and experiences. I don't know if you could like draw as direct a parallel from narrator to author because I, I do generally think it's a little bit sketchy when critics start to do that but I think yeah he definitely yeah he definitely uses himself as material for sure. And, and like and that he raises this question of identity. Yes yeah yeah like I think in Norwegian words it's sort of the um, protagonist coming to know himself through his relationships with these three women um, and what they each mean to him and how he grows or develops or doesn't develop um, and by the end there's just this like beautiful elegiac 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 I don't know <laughs> Mark <laughs> Mode says elegiac and it's thrown me off um, but there's this, yeah, elegiac, however you say it, um, feeling of uh, like a longing for a past self or a future self, like some, someone that you're not quite yet or have been and aren't anymore. Um, yeah, there's definitely an exploration of self and identity through uh, your own experience, through the author's own uh, experience and definitely narrative perspective as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, would you recommend, like, would you tell someone to go on and, like, you said you were glad you read Murakami. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that he is a, um, would, he, would you recommend him firstly to other people um, or would you tend to veer towards other books? No, I think, I think everyone should read, at least read Norwegian Wood because it's like entry level, uh, there's honestly something for everyone um, if you like a good romance like me if there's you know there's like deeper philosophical aspects to the to the story as well um, I do think everyone should read Norwegian Wood also because it's such a pillar of Japanese culture and literature I like it's just interesting to read it and then think about the impact that it had post-publication I suppose um, 
But if you read Norwegian Wood, like don't expect any of his other books to be in that <laughs> same vein, which is a mistake that I made. I was like, I love this. The rest of them are going to be like gorgeous and beautiful and rich like this one was. And they were, I don't know if they were gorgeous and beautiful, but they were rich and dense and tightly packed with lots of different thoughts, but not in the same sort of sentimental way, I suppose, which, like, you know, I love that <laughs> but yeah I think it's they're very different I would say go on and read at least one other after Norwegian Wood but yeah don't don't expect similar things <laughs> I'll take you up on that advice <laughs> I'll go do my duty um, <laughs> what, what are you reading at the moment just to, before we close what are you yeah hold on let me look up the I haven't got it next to me let me look up the name um so, oh, where's it gone? Sorry, this is, okay, yeah. So I was, I had picked up, um, I finished a book of Kate Chopin short stories yesterday, which was incredible. And I had picked up um, uh, A Room of One's Own to read, which I've not read yet. And I was like, this is the perfect time. But actually, um, given all of the current events and the uh, riots happening in the US and all of the, like the several disgusting murders of black people that are going on by police in the US, um, I decided to read, um, it's called Between the World and Me by ta Coates. I think that's how you say his name. Um, I've come across him. Hang on, let me Google. I've definitely come across that name before. <laughs> Tell me more about it. I think he was a journalist at The Atlantic and has written a couple of books. No. Yes. yes. Um, are you, have you just started it? Yeah, so I'm like 70-ish pages in and it's just incredible. Like, it's framed as an address to his 15-year-old son. I think it came out in 20... 15, 2017, I'm not sure, but a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, it just, it really frames, it's very theoretical and very like good on the theory of racism and the constructs of it, but relates it back to his own personal experience and brings that to a theoretical plane and the theoretical plane to the personal in just, a very very good way that makes you really like fully comprehend it um and brings like brings the corporeal to the fore as well which i think is you know you can't deny it when like three murders have happened by the police in the past week um but yeah if anyone is looking to um educate themselves on racism in america i could i couldn't you know recommend a better book to start with i will be pitched through that as well <laughs> <laughs> um, on a side note, um, a room with one's own is so worth the hype. I remember, like, when I I read it, um, and I was just like, "But this is it!" Like, you know, it's not it's not complex. Like, yeah. you know, it, it is just the idea that, like, if you're going to create art, you need the space and time to create art, um, yeah, yeah. and the money <laughs> to have space and time. Um, but it's she. It's actually I've never really gotten on with um Mrs. Dalloway, or I've never loved them but a room of one's own and her essays um i've got her what do I, have? I have something else that i've loved of hers um mm -hmm. I'd highly i think you'll enjoy that after this <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm just enjoying like I'm just, after uni i was like i'm gonna set myself a little reading modules so like if i have several books like of the same ilk i'll just like read them through and then like have a switch up and do something else so i've been on uh Recently, it's been turn of the century American female writers, and now I'm on like that seems like a nice little hop to Virginia Woolf with yeah. my, little, my interlude of racism in the middle. <laughs> Flies to both. <laughs> Was definitely still a feature then. <laughs> I mean, these women are so. You read it and you're like. God, you're so like limited in your viewpoint. Yeah. And obviously, like they all say very valuable things, but it is a very limited perspective. And it's interesting to keep that in mind, whilst also noting that they've been very seminal. But. Absolutely, yeah. It's always it's always the tension, isn't it? And there's always an expectation with seminal texts that you're getting sort of 
impact that the text has had in addition to like the yeah. text itself aren't you totally yes that's very well put i don't think i've been able to word it in that way but yeah you're looking for like that aha moment when you read it and sometimes you just read it and you're like well that was good i enjoyed it <laughs> and that's fine that's an okay reaction to have <laughs> i reassure myself <laughs> anyway thank you so much like really really talking to me. no not at all um, so yeah bye everyone <laughs> next i'm so excited to introduce beatrice ballerini um i love this interview um i my favorite bits um are when b um explains some times where translation went a little bit wrong i hope you enjoy <laughs> Um, hello everyone, um, I am here today with the wonderful B, um, Beatrice ba Ballerini. Yes, that's <laughs> that correct. <laughs> hello, hello everybody, hope you're safe and well. Um, um, yeah, sorry. Go on, tell us a little bit about you. Um, how did you come, so B is a translator, um, from, do you do just Italian to English or? Yeah, so I do both directions, I mean I try, um, it is quite tricky. Uh, but I'll, <clears throat> I'll explain a, bit, a little bit later on why I prefer to concentrate on two languages only. Um, I did my bachelor's degree in, in linguistics and um, linguistic and cultural mediation, uh, and that was in Rome, where I'm from. And then I did my master's degree here in Leeds um, in audiovisual translation, uh, and I specialised in subtitling. Um, one of the branches of my course was literary translation. I decided not to pursue that one because I could choose certain exams from that course anyway. So I took some modules um, and one of them was literary translation, which was the core module for them, just a side module for me. Because um, I wanted to learn specific, uh, you know, specific techniques on how to subtitle which of course involved programs and a lot of things that otherwise I don't think I would have learned because they're not, I mean, the programs themselves, apart from being really expensive, they're not very easy to understand on your own. I think you do need a guide. Um, and in my case, I always need someone to really explain to very clearly things like a tutorial on YouTube won't do. So I needed a mentor to guide me through it. And it was, it was a good choice, I think. Um, and I'm a bookseller also, too. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I love books, of course. I adore books. So, yes. So you're that's... in the right place. Um, how was it? That, so, did you, when did you start learning English? Um, and wh why was it English that you gravitated um, towards translating from? So, ironically, it was mainly from translated books. Uh, because, of course, by, by reading Italian translations of your Harry Potters and all that stuff, um, mainly fantasy, because that's what I gravitate towards. Um, <laughs> not not anymore now, it's a bit more. Um, when I was a kid, it was only fantasy, I think it was my thing. Um, and then I started to read uh, books that were set in England and Scotland. Um, and I started to be fascinated by uh, the British culture. Uh, then I, as I grew older, I started to learn even the darkest sides, let's say, of, of British culture. And I ended up finding that thrilling as well. I loved it. Um, uh, of course, as, I mean, stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. it just sort of, it gives you the rough side as well. And it's, it's amazing. It just, I felt like, I really need to see these places. And um, when I was about, I think the first time I um, I came here on holiday with my sister, I was 18. It was my 18th birthday present from my family. Um, and I then, I went to London other like nine times after that. I would, every time I had holiday, I would go um, to the UK, which means that now that I moved to the UK, I haven't really been anywhere else. I only go to Italy and to the UK from and to, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll get around to go into other places as well because it's a bit sad, but it just speaks to how committed I am <laughs> in my love for, for this culture. And that's one of the reasons why 
even though I learned other languages, I can, I can speak other languages. I, I did French, I did Spanish. I would never say that I can translate them. Um, because even though I can get by, I can speak, I can understand, that's, that's fine, that's one thing. But I can't really, I don't know the culture that well. I don't know, I haven't lived there. There's, I haven't read many novels in the original language. There's so much you can't understand if you don't really live the culture. How, how important is that cultural aspect, sort of like the slang um, and the the way, because obviously language is changing all the time. Um, yeah. So how like, how important so, is that to translate? Um, for instance, there's, um, you know, Anne Goldstein, the translator of Elena Ferrante. So um, many people reading Elena Ferrante in English think that she must write in Italian in dialect. But she doesn't, in fact, um, and she gives a lot of reasons for it, uh, partly because um, it's just uh, she talks about dialect as the language of home, um, of strong emotions, children speak dialect, uh, whilst Italian is more like your language of it symbolizes education, going away from your home, knowing the bigger picture. Um, and she she just says that dialect is mainly for the spoken word and uh, certain parts certain parts of the text i guess could lose their you know their poignance um and of course you need the rich language of italian to describe certain things and she's got i mean her prose is amazing um so nothing to take out of authors that use dialects like uh, as i say i was on about uh, irving welsh earlier i love how it's written in in Scottish, but what the Italian translator of his books did, which I'm fairly sure it's the same one, his um, can't remember his name, Massimo something. <laughs> um, he created this sort of like colloquial, uneducated Italian, oh. caked in swear words completely. Uh, but he recreated this like crisp, crude Scottish dialect. Uh, and train spotting, filth, um, glue, porno, they were huge in Italy. Um, and arguably, thanks to the translator, in a way. That's so interesting. I had no idea. I didn't even like consider, obviously, Irvin Welsh's books are, must be, like, you must get that as a translator and be like, what? <laughs> exactly. Like, I, I, I hadn't read them. I'm reading now a couple, I'm, I'm reading filth now in uh, in English, and it's it's really hard to understand, even though... As they have tried to educate myself as as well as I could in the Scottish dialect, but it's still super hard. <laughs> I just don't know how to read certain words. They just make no sound in my head. And I'm like, oh, how do I do this? Uh, so why um, do you have one direction of translation that you prefer to translate in? Um, well, I, I prefer to do a better job. And of course <laughs> I do that by translating from English into Italian because I just feel more comfortable understanding English culture instead of interpreting into English culture because I don't, I'm not yet that comfortable to feel like I definitely made this sound natural to an English speaker, to a British person, whatever. It's also very hard to translate in English for both American and British audience. You never translate for targeting one or the other, so you have to find a standard English and culture for everybody, which makes it a bit, takes it away a little bit, because by living in Britain, you're like, I know exactly how to translate this, but I can't, because of course Americans wouldn't get it, or, you know, Australians, and it's just, it's just very different, so you need to, instead of zooming too much in um, from something that is very precise, maybe, in your source text, so I don't know, you're translating from a Sicilian book with Sicilian culture, and you need to just take it so far out and so relatable to all anglicised countries yeah. that uh, you're never going to do it perfectly. Uh, so what I prefer to do is doing the opposite. So I prefer to give to Italians because I don't know because Italian is mainly only spoken in Italy, so you don't have to talk to that <laughs> many, you know, people. So maybe yeah, definitely that direction, English into Italian. 
um, is there, a, that's so interesting, <laughs> um, are there particular differences between, um, obviously you don't have like loads of experience in literary translation, but what was it about audio and visual that drew you and what sort of specialities does it have? So this, um, this one mainly, I, I like everything. I like interpreting, I like literary translation and I like audiovisual. Although I, I don't think everybody's supposed to do anything. You need to ask yourself, what are you good at? Um, and I'm very good at following rules in a way. Um, there's too much freedom in literature. Uh, too many choices and too much to go. I, I have a tremendous respect for literary translators and I, I don't like it when people read books and go like, oh, this translation is disgusting. And then, cause it's like, you need to understand that there were a billion things that person could have chosen to do. And they have to think of their priorities. Um, I'm going to talk about priorities in literary translations later. Uh, for now, as I say, I, I just ask myself, can you do interpreting? Interpreting is about translating super fast. You need a fast decision. You need to prioritize, um, you know, maybe not the exact meaning, but a fast one that people will understand. I could never do that. Um, I would say if, if, you know, I would say my best thing is I can translate correctly with the right time, you know, not too fast, not too slow, uh, but with rules. With I, I love a set of rules because I feel like I'm safer, um, which arguably is a little sad, but hey. And that's subtitling because you have a specific number of, um, you know, words, lines, um, punctuation must be used in a certain way, um, you have to summarise what's been said in a certain way, you have to go from one subtitle to the next in a certain way, you don't want to overlap subtitles over screen changes, you have to know what the eyes do when you look at a film, so you know that you don't want to make a sentence too difficult, otherwise you, you're going to read the sentence again and again and you're never going to look at the screen. So it's it's funny, I, I, I sorry, it's fun. I like to to play that way, to sort of go like, yes, this is perfect, because you read it, it's immediate, then you have all the time in the world to look. Um, and I really like it. Yeah, it does. There's so much, with everything in translation, there's so much more to it than like you would maybe think, because I think especially in a world where we're used to um, YouTube videos having captions, and often they're actually done by people who volunteer to do the captions. Yeah. Um, that, that, I mean, of course, they're doing, they're doing it for free. So again, mm -hmm. I, don't like, I don't like the idea of someone criticising their translation, because that's free work. Like, nobody's paying them to do it. <laughs> Um, so, <clears throat> not that it should be, I mean, I don't like it when something is translated in a way that you clearly could have chosen to do the right thing, but it's somehow for no reason a completely different take and it can be confusing for the viewer, uh, but most of the things that people criticize are very simple, tiny things that is like, okay, you just want to show that you know that word, how it's translated in that language, but you have to understand that it's not exactly how the process goes. So I love fan subs, I love um, YouTube translation, even if they're not perfect, you can see that there's passion there and they go, of course, um, automated captions are a completely different thing, they just come from audio and they're terrible sometimes. <laughs> but it's the fastest thing, so if you want something to be translated immediately and you want to enjoy it right then in the moment, you'll have to sort of you know, go with the flow like you do with uh, interpreting. I mean, listening to an interpreter can be confusing sometimes, depending on, um, yeah, the, the situation, but you get the gist. <laughs> yeah. Um, can we go back to that point about the sort of priorities of literary translation? Yes, absolutely. So uh, there are different methods. Um, from translator to translator, of course, you study them all when you're in uni and then you kind of decide what direction you want to go to. I did my undergrad in a method called uh, Scopus theory, um, which is basically, basically says that the most important thing is the aim of the piece that you're writing, whether it's a film or a book or whatever, you need to ask the author or the publisher or whoever owns the work what is the aim of this do you want to i don't know 
write a book about uh, animals? Do you want to convince people to go vegan? Do you want to, I don't know, just talk about how cute animals are? Do, do you just don't care and you just want the, the beautiful prose in the book? Um, are animals just a symbol? You just want to use the language as your beautiful you know, message? And you ask them, there needs to be this communication between author and translator, otherwise it's going to inevitably go wrong. It's not, I mean, it's nobody's fault, it's just you need communication. Um, then the priority right under that, it's, it's quite, it's a pyramid actually. I might be mm. able to, no, it's I a, don't know how to. to I actually, um, I actually feel like I might know this, so this can be a test, because there's like three parts to it, isn't it? There's the purpose, then there's the, um, like, f faithfulness is the third part, like, sort of. So it's, it's divided yeah. in five, but I oh. think it's been, it's been summarised into three in some texts, because it's easier, because some are just a bit, but it's, uh, it's five, and then the sixth sort of says all the ones above are to be considered in hierarchical order with the 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 aim dominating all the others so you've got aim you've got that the translation has to be an offer of information so it's not truth it's an offer from the translator of look this is what was said so the the second principle is 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 an offer of information of another offer of information that was done in the source uh, culture and the source language so it's a diluted text you, it's never going to be the same experience as the original then the third is that is not clearly reversible which means that of course you're never going to flip it on its head and it's going to turn back into the um the source language um it's it must be internally coherent and then it must be coherent with the source text uh, and that's it. And that's your priority. So this means that the fact that it's coherent with the source text is definitely not as important as it needs to be an offer of information. It's definitely not as important as the aim. So that's how I guess one should translate, but that's my personal take. So you're going to see a lot of difference. Mm. Uh, I'm definitely not a purist. Um, so I guess there's a lot of texts that I wouldn't be the best person uh, to translate um, I don't mind changing a text uh, but I think you have to work side by side by side with the author at all times because you can't just decide to change something I've seen stuff that was scary there's um, <laughs> like in Stephen King um, there's um, this book called Firestarter and um, there's a scene in which uh, there's a waitress. So the, the text says that um, they sat at the, um, at the bar and this waitress with a fine figure comes. Um, and in Italian, <laughs> it, was, it was disgusting. It was translated as um, a waitress with a fine figure wearing a flowery dress with an ample cleavage completely added out of nowhere and I don't know what it was it was probably a decision from the publisher I don't think it was the translator because why would you unless you thought that that specific part needed you to be specifically attracted to that waitress I have no idea why the flowers no no but um it's a lot of little things that make you think okay this is strange but fascinating I guess um and there are a lot of examples like that. Uh, there are just mistakes out of, um, usually uh, the, they're under pressure. They have to give the work quite quickly. So they're not going to check things twice, even though the person they give the word, the translation to should check. That's the proofreading that should do it. So it's, it's not okay to blame the translator only. There mm. are a number of people that check it. Um, for instance, in Harry Potter, there are like, Italian Facebook groups only talking about all the mistakes that there are in the translations because of course we all grew up and we all learned English because we all loved Britain after Harry Potter so now we, we can all see all the various mistakes. I think the most famous ones is the locket. There is this locket in the sixth volume of Harry Potter and it was translated in Italian as padlock instead of what it actually is. 
So that was really confusing because you couldn't understand why someone would wear this padlock. <laughs> um, <laughs> so sometimes it is really, really dangerous and you have to always, always ask from the, the aim to any doubt that comes in your head, you should be able to communicate directly with the author, but it's not always possible. It's, I mean, usually it's not possible. So I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so interesting hearing about specific examples. Um, are, there any, <laughs> are there any others that you have that you've saved? Um, so sometimes it, it, it happens. Oh, oh, well, yeah, actually talking about fantasy. Um, G.R. Martin, Game of Thrones, there's volume one. Um, there's this scene where the Stark brothers and Ned Stark, the father, find this um, dead wolf mother. and um, the cause of death in the book, of course, is discovered. It, it has these like antlers in, in its neck, and that's how it died. And um, in Italian, it was translated as unicorn horn, <laughs> which, of course, puts a lot of confusion there because, of course, you have to include unicorns in the whole universe, <laughs> which, of course, they don't come back ever because they didn't exist in the first place. And... Um, and of course, later on, in new editions, of course, they, they took care of it because the other problem was that it's, it, was, it was symbolic because the stag is the symbol of the other house in uh, one of the other houses in Game of Thrones, which is the Baratheon house. And of course, it was a symbol of, you know, Baratheon killing the wolf, which is the symbol of the Stark house. So it was a huge mistake because, <laughs> of course, you would have had to change the Baratheon house to a unicorn instead of a stag and it would have been dreadful so some are really some some mistakes really matter um then um smaller ones uh, and usually they're only because there are different translators for a saga so i don't know the um, or even different translations for an author that tends to write i don't know like kurt vonnegut mm. six translators initially with the same publishing house which is dreadful for, you know, Kurt Vonnegut readers will know. Every book kind of intertwines with the other, characters come back, uh, little things are sort of like, it's very fun to read his novels. But that's the thing, if you have different translators, they might not check the other translations. At some things you just can't really understand. You'll, you'll never figure out, maybe you'll figure out some characters have come back because the names will be the same but certain references will be lost and it's a shame because you yeah. know um, it's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> it is a shame um harry potter had five different translators as well and they had consultant consultants as well so that makes i don't know 12 people involved in the whole thing and names were changed because uh, that's the the problem in harry potter is not translating the book must be quite easy because it's a very simple language problem is names songs places they're all very like you know names with a meaning right so you need to translate that and they're, they're very different from book to book sometimes and it's quite annoying yeah, yeah. pulls you out of the continuity um if you had to recommend some books that have been translated from italian into english for people who were looking um to read a bit more italian literature where would you start um, if you like thriller, I was thinking Andrea Camilleri's The Shape of Water is the first one of a series. It's really good, uh, set in Sicily, so it gives you a really good vibe of what it's like there. Um, then uh, Donato Carisi, The Vanished Ones, is really good. And Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose is a bit bigger, is a bit heavier, but it's an amazing gothic thriller. Great. Um, if you like dramas, so these are, are quite a bit heavy, but that they're really worth the pain. Um, there's Don't Move by Margaret Mazzantini. Um, there's El Samorante's Arturo's Island, really, really good, it's at Naples. Um, so if you like um, that kind of stuff, uh, like um, Camilleri, it's kind of the same, but set in a different part of Italy, it gives you a really good vibe of the place. Um, and then Oriana Fallaci, A Man, amazing book luckily it's available it is the one that i wanted to recommend um the ones that are a little harder to find but they're worth it 
are the historical ones. There's um, Chess 85 Aces books about Second World War and the resistance initially. Um, the Moon and the Bonfires is amazing. House on the Hill and um, one called, it's a collection of three books. It's called The Beautiful Summer. And there's specifically one called Among Women Only. That is really great. Um, and then there's, if you like, like Roman, ancient Roman historical ones, Valerio Massimo Manfredi and everything he wrote, basically, they're all great. But The Last Legion is my favorite. It's the one they made the film out of. Yes. Um, and then there's one by Dasha Mariani called Train to Budapest. That's really good as well. It's actually not Budapest in Italian. It's another city. Not sure why they changed it. Uh, I didn't know myself because I only read it in Italian. So when I went to look for it, I was really confused. But I'm, I'm sure it's wonderfully translated. So that's really worth it. And then if you like teen fiction, something like Coming of Age, stuff like that, um, Jack Frusciante has left the band by Enrico Brizzi is amazing. And I'm going to put them all in a little document. I'm going to send it to you. Pretty much, I'm absolutely um, going to post a photo of the, the recommendations that I'm going to get B to send me on. Um, so if you want to see a full list of recommendations from B, yeah, I'll, I'll put some light stuff as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was such a joy, um, and I learned so much. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me, and it's so good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much um, for listening and I hope you enjoyed everything Jemima had to say and um, I certainly did. Um, I also hope you enjoyed seeing this site become a real, a real thing. Um, tune in tomorrow for a few more interviews.